pelvic organ prolapse part 2. This is Dairoga video 32 and the last one of this year. Welcome back. In part 1 we discussed some of the background information regarding pelvic organ prolapse or uterogenic prolapse. In this uh, second video we'll focus on management options. Expected management, reducing risk factors or addressing modifiable factors, pelvic floor muscle training, pessary and an operation with either native tissue repair or mesh. We will see that this topic is not an easy one and I try to get uh, the basics across. We finish as always with conclusions. The sunset seen here in Adelaide um, in the foothills three minutes later, a uh, fantastic depiction, a uh, fantastic picture which is moving. Okay, the management options. As we just saw, the expectant management option means you address modifiable risk factors, pelvic floor training, mechanical pessary, and an operation. The question now is, when would you recommend what option? It's not an easy answer. It depends very much on how bad the prolapse symptoms are and her specific circumstances such as risk factors or uh, have previous have other attempts be done to address the prolapse. Um, the modifiable causes. Um, in my experience women expect us to um, do a quick fix. Uh, they think operation will permanently fix the problem and as we will see that's not the case. So important to um, trying to motivate her to uh, change lifestyle and risk factors uh, um, such as chronic cough, um, sorry, chronic cough, constipation, heavy lifting and obesity. And as you all know, uh, addressing those issues requires an effort of the woman herself and um, she needs to be motivated for that. Um, expectant and pelvic floor muscle training. The pelvic floor muscle training in general will be done by a dedicated physiotherapist who will give the woman specific instructions and there are different ways to do this. Um, what does the research show us? Uh, here a recent publication in the British Medical Journal where um, 287 women were randomized to either expectant management or pelvic floor muscle training also referred to as pelvic floor exercise. <clears throat> and we can see here that the women eventually that the pelvic floor distress inventory significantly improved by 9.1 points but important to note that we should regard an improvement of at least 16 points to be clinically significant. Uh, when women were asked uh, how they thought about the overall improvement of symptoms, expected management resulted just waiting, 30% improved, so that could be regarded as the placebo effect, and 57% reported improvement with pelvic floor muscle training, which is significant. So pelvic floor muscle training dedicated uh, is important to offer as a conservative treatment option, and important that those pelvic floor muscle training have to be done permanently. It's not just a brief intervention for your month. You have to do it for the rest of your life. So it should become part of your lifestyle. Another study which um, um, were in women were randomized to um, lifestyle advice without pelvic floor training and pelvic floor training one-to-one um, -one with a dedicated uh, physiotherapist. Here we see that the symptoms with pelvic floor training improved, but not significantly. So there was a, a favorable trend, but uh, statistically seen, there was no difference. Um, the pessary. Pessary can be offered in women who are, or should be offered if women are unfit for operation. The operation would be too risky for them. Women, in, uh, when they are uh, demented, or when women do not want the operation, or sometimes, to bridge the waiting time for an operation. 
of notice that the pessary itself does not cure the prolapse. It simply mechanically elevates the prolapse and prevents it from descending. Different type of vaginal pessaries are available. Um, I just would like to point at the most um, frequently ones used in Australian practice. Here on the left top corner we have the so-called ring pessary. Um, then here on the right hand side the so-called donut pessary which um, takes up more volume and um, the third one here is the so-called the flexible gel horn pessary. The first and the second one are made of very soft silicon and that means they are gentle to the vaginal wall. Um, for women who are sexually active there's an option that they can remove especially the ring pessary and, uh, her, that she can remove that herself after instructions. This is a diagram which shows how you could estimate what size of pessary to offer her. There are special boxes with uh, measuring pessaries, but it's too far, too detailed for this purpose. Here we see a um, soft silicon ring pessary if it's fitted correctly. So one part is in the fornix posterior, as you can see here, and the anterior part elevates the anterior vaginal wall. And you can imagine if this lady had a, a cystocele, that this would actually um, elevate the cystocele and improve her symptoms. This picture shows how to insert a donut pessary. Insertion of the pessary is quite, yeah, um, you have to pass through the introitus, which is quite, gives some discomfort, but with um, explanation and apologies, that's quite often very acceptable. Here we see another diagram where the gel horn pessary is inside you and can understand that this would offer support in case of a uterine descent. The vaginal wall anteriorly and posteriorly is stretched somewhat and this is an option, a treatment option for pessary as well. If you look at the research, here is a study, a randomized clinical trial, just uh, published in 2016, where women um, with stage 1 to 3 uh, POP-Q classification were randomized. Um, and one group, they were, and by the way, the vast majority of women had a cystocele, one third of the women had a uterine descent, and only 5% had a rectocele. But those women with a mean age of 62 years were randomized to either a vaginal pessary or pelvic floor muscle training. And at 12 months time, the researchers looked at the impact both treatment options had. After 12 months, the women, those women had, with a vaginal pessary, had a significant improvement of the pelvic organ, prolapse, distress inventory score, so that's a measure for uh, prolapse symptoms, and other questionnaire also regarding pelvic floor showed also significant improvement. And altogether, if women were asked, did you feel that your symptoms improved? 61% in a vaginal pessary group and 28% in a pelvic floor muscle training group improved, uh, uh, reported improved symptoms. So both treatment options have an effect, but the vaginal pessary um, outperformed pelvic floor muscle training. Of notice, one of the side effects of vaginal pessary is that it gives pressure, um, it causes pressure on the vaginal epithelium and, it's, and eventually it could result in an abrasion or even an ulceration of the vaginal wall if the pessary is left inside you for a long time. That's why the common advice is, current advice is to combine the vaginal pessary with the administration of topical estrogens in the vagina. These topical estrogens are also used for women who suffer from vaginal atrophy, from dryness and dyspareunia. Um, in Australia we have available an estriol or vestin cream combined which can be inserted with by the use of an applicator. Here we see the diagram. Um, the applicator is being filled. Uh, by squeezing 
the uh, a Vestin tube and disconnect it from each other and then can be gently inserted deep into vagina. And usually we do that, we recommend to do that in the evening at night. Alternative, there's also vaginal pessaries, 500 micrograms, um, and they can be inserted in the vagina as well at night. Some, uh, yeah, women prefer, uh, in general tend to prefer the little pessary, the little ovule, because it's less messy. It's quite confusing, but uh, <laughs> women are requested to insert a vaginal pessary with estriol when they are wearing a pessary to prevent complications. Okay, the other management aspect of pessaries, so um, the topical estradiol or estriol cream or pessaries, usually application twice a week is sufficient to prevent abrasions. Um, it's a, it makes sense to instruct women to observe any brown or blood stained PV discharge because that will be pointing at abrasion and ulceration. So uh, increase the, do the administration of the estriol cream and if the symptoms improve then she can back to the usual uh, twice a week administration. Um, initially it's important to check the pessary maybe six weeks to make sure that the uh, there's no abrasions, that is fitted well, and that it improved, has improved the symptoms. And if stable, and the woman is more comfortable with the idea of this foreign body, um, then checking every six months is probably uh, warranted. Instruct the lady always to present earlier if, if symptoms such as PV dis uh, blood stain discharge. And as we discussed already, for some women who are sexually active, they, uh, we can instruct them to remove and reinsert the pessary themselves. The fourth treatment option is surgery. For a cystocele, seal, traditionally an anterior vaginal wall repair was offered um, as first procedure. And nowadays we have an alternative um, the so-called mesh repair. Um, we will discuss that later into detail. Sometimes um, site-specific repair can be offered if part of the levator muscle is um, dislodged, uh, especially after um, a difficult vaginal delivery or um, forceps delivery, site-specific repair. For the rectus seal, traditionally, uh, is offered a posterior vaginal wall repair and um, again here a mesh repair is also an option. Enterocele repair if there is uh, involvement of the small bowel in the prolapse. Vaginal hysterectomy of course if there is the main component is the uterine descent as part of the prolapse and sometimes Sacral culpo suspension can be offered if women have vaginal vault prolapse, in particular after a previous hysterectomy. Um, there are many more procedures available, but I don't want to confuse you. These are the, the most common ones offered. And we will focus now on each of these procedures. Uh, what are the pluses and minuses? Firstly, the anterior repair or the anterior culporophy. The traditional midline repair. Here are a few diagrams to in, uh, explain the principles. The woman is in the dorsal lithotomy position. The anterior vagina wall is injected with a local anesthetic plus adrenaline to reduce the blood loss. And here we can see that the incision has been made in the anterior vagina wall. The dotted line represents what um, where we are going to incise the anterior vagina wall further. And here the scissors are undermining, uh, are creating space between the anterior vagina wall here and the bladder a little bit more posteriorly. Now the next diagram showed that the vagina wall has been incised in the midline and has been opened up. It's, we can see here some clips opening the vagina wall completely. And now we have a view of the 
cystocele itself. It's now separately visible from the anterior vaginal wall. And then the midline placation, you can see here interrupted sutures by which the bulge of the vagina of the cystocele will be reduced. So the stitches, uh, this is the so-called midline traditional placation with native tissue. So the placation of the layers of the muscularis and the adventitia, so that's the serosa of the bladder, that is what the tissue which has, which is used for the placation technique. Of notice that this procedure has a reasonably high failure rate, which is between 20 and 30 percent. So important to counsel women about that preoperatively. After the procedure, we leave an indwelling catheter in the bladder and we insert a so-called vaginal pack, a big gauze into the vagina to compress the tissue to minimize the risk for bleeding. And the next morning, both the indwelling catheter and vaginal pack can be removed and the lady will undergo a so-called trial of void to see whether she's able to empty her bladder completely. If not, sometimes that means we have to reinsert the indwelling catheter and leave it in for a few more days. Complications are hematoma formation, damage to the bladder or ureter, fistula formation, uh, de novo voiding problems, urinary retention, as we discussed already. The anterior vaginal repair can also be addressed by inserting a xenograft, synthetic material. Um, here on the right hand side you can see the so-called open, woven, non-absorbable polypropylene mesh. This is the artificial tissue which can be ins uh, inserted as an extra layer between the bladder here and the vagina there. This is a diagram from uh, sideways where you can see the mesh inside, inside you uh, next to the bladder. And this results in elevation of the cystocele and it eventually fibroblasts will grow in so eventually an extra layer of connective tissue will, occur, um, will appear. Um, the same procedure principles apply to the posterior vaginal wall repair also called posterior colporaphy. The Placation of the pararectal and the rectal vagina fascia takes place, so the defects will be uh, closed by reapproximating the defects in the fascia. And sometimes the fascia, the pre-rectal fascia, is connected to the uteral sacral ligaments, which results in elevation of the rectocele, which uh, addresses the rectocele quite nicely. Uh, um, of course, we can also repair specific defects in the fascia with um, interrupted sutures. Complications, hematoma, damage to the rectum or rectal vaginal fistula, which are rare. And of course, during the operation, we will explicitly check that the rectum itself is intact. Here we see a few diagrams to illustrate, illustrate the principles. The lady is in dorsal dysophimic position. Here is where um, a diamond-shaped part of the posterior vaginal wall is, has been excised. Um, after an in, in, injection of local anesthetic and adrenaline of the posterior vaginal wall. And here is where the pre-rectal fascia, here depicted as white, is being reapproximated with interrupted sutures. Here we can see that the closure has taken place of the pre-rectal fascia. That means uh, that the, the wall between the vagina and the rectum has been reinforced. Eventually we can trim the, some tissue of the vaginal wall away. And the last step is that the vaginal wall is uh, closed again as here demonstrated with um, interrupted sutures. Again, these are the broad principles. You will see there are a lot of variations um, based on doctor's preference, based on your own experience. 
Also for the posterior vaginal wear, we can offer um, a mesh repair. Here we can see the posterior vaginal wall mesh, which has two arms. And here two diagrams. This is the anterior view where you can see that the arms are on each side of the rectum and uh, eventually the mesh is placed between the rectum here and the vagina there. And the same is visible from a medial view where here are the arms of the mesh and this is the, uh, the common part of the mesh which sits actually uh, behind the vaginal wall and the rectum eventually. Let's look at some evidence. Um, I have chosen two randomized clinical trials and a recent uh, Cochrane systematic review. What were the primary outcomes when we compare anterior vaginal mesh versus the tertiary midline placation after two months and one year? Personally, I'm not as much interested in results after two months, but the long-term results are important for the woman, of course. Sorry for this uh, copy, which is not very, uh, very clear, but um, roughly 189 women underwent a traditional repair and 200 women were randomized to have the mesh repair. And we see at two years that the composite primary outcome was better in the mesh repair group compared to the topography group. Uh, the anatomical results if you look at the pop q after the procedure after one year the same more favorable in the mesh repair group interesting however if you look if you would ask the woman what they perceived of the prolapse symptoms there was um, a difference but that was not significant so subjectively the same amount of women had an improvement of their prolapse symptoms and the, regardless of the procedure um, the UDI, the urinary distress inventory, which is a measure for um, incontinence and, and bladder problems, there were no significant difference after one year. So the conclusion of these authors was, as compared with anterior corporography, the use of a standardized mesh kit for sister seal repair resulted in higher short-term rates of success treatment but also in higher rate of complications and post-operative events. So more better efficacy, but more complications. Of notice that this study was sponsored by the mesh company. Um, and of course, that could have contributed to some bias. Another randomized clinical trial where porcine collagen-coated mesh has been used and compared with anterior corporography repair. And now the results of the study were three years. So that's a much, uh, yeah, much more relevant three years result. Um, the POPQ, um, the same comparable findings as the, compared to the previous study, the POPQ um, after the mesh was significantly improved in 90, 1% versus only 41 in the corporate group, so that is a significant difference. However, there were no subjective differences in pelvic floor um, uh, questionnaires, in, in various questionnaires, which give um, an impression of the severity of the prolapse. Same here, no differences in urinary incontinence or sexual questionnaire scores. In the comment of this um, uh, publication, a study, by the way, done in, uh, in Sweden, the number of mesh exposures did not change during the study period and all exposures. So the side effects of the mesh, that the mesh is not completely covered by vaginal wall, but is visible and can result in dyspareunia, but that was reported as to be minor. Interesting as well that the tweetable abstract of this study was uh, as followed. POPQ deteriorates after anterior prolapse surgery, but remains stable in women with mesh implantation. So it's almost like an ad for the mesh implantation. However, if you look at the results and all the details, it, um, it has a few more nuances than this very positive message. For instance, 
if you look at other results after three years, the bulge feeling, the lump feeling, the typical prolapse feeling, was significantly better after the mesh. Sexual activity, by the way, um, significantly more women were sexually, remained sexually active after the traditional repair. And that was not a tweetable um, extract. So I think that's important to take on board as well. That's part of quality of life. New dyspareunia, no differences. Repeat repair. Three of the women in the anterior corporography group had to go a repeat procedure. Mesh exposure was the case in 14.7% of the mesh group. So easy to come to a tweetable conclusion, but if you look at the details, uh, there is more to say about these studies. The last um, evidence I would like to present is the Cochrane database systematic review, permanent transvaginal mesh versus traditional copor corporography. Um, Recurrence of prolapse after three years on examination, significantly better after vaginal mesh. Prolapse symptoms, significantly improved in the mesh group. Um, need for repeat surgery, including 8% for mesh exposure, was significantly more in the mesh group compared to the corporography group. De novo stress incontinence, those differences were not or significantly worse in the mesh group as well. Risk for bladder injury, significantly more in the mesh group. New dyspareunia, no differences. So, while mesh appears to be more uh, effective in treating the prolapse symptoms, it is associated with a higher risk for recurrence and a higher risk of complications. Uh, in that regard, in the United States, the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, has, warned an official, has issued an official warning regarding the use of mesh. And the latest, what I've heard, to mesh or not to mesh, that the company is considering to withdraw mesh from the market due to the litigation. At this stage, there is a lawsuit taking place where tens of thousands of women um, are involved um, and so watch this space. So conclusion, the treatment of prolapse is not as easy as you might have liked at the beginning of this lecture, but there are a few options. Expectant, addressing modifiable causes, which means the ball is back in the woman's court. Pelvic floor muscle training surely have shown to be beneficial. The same with pessary for a dedicated group of women who do not want or not safe to undergo an operation, important that we combine the pessary with topical estrogens and surgical options. Um, the, also good, the observation, some observational studies have shown that prolapse does not necessarily worsen over time. So if the symptoms are mild, uh, watchful waiting is a reasonable option. The choice depends eventually on the patient's quality of life, her specific circumstances and risk factors, but also the doctor's experience and preference. Um, clear from the studies that we need more long-term uh, follow-up evidence. And that's hard because both researchers and drug companies have an interest to publish um, the findings after one year rather than waiting for full five years for obvious reasons. But also we need to include the complications and most importantly the, uh, the woman's all, or the, the, her satisfaction, all of satisfaction after the procedure. So but I personally uh, suggest to offer a less invasive approach if that's feasible and try maybe conservative measures first and if they fail then we can move on to offer an operation. And probably it makes sense to offer a traditional repairs as the first intervention uh, until we have more certainty about the mesh. And I think at this stage it's probably safest to reserve mesh for repair prolapse situations. So most certainly this is not a condition where a quick and permanent fix is easily available. 
In the meantime, the sun is almost set here in Adelaide and this finishes, this is the conclusion of the 32nd Daroga video. And uh, Jimmy is very pleased to tell you that we have at this stage more than 18,000 views and 152 subscribers. So thank you and I hope this was a useful uh, topic, um, lecture about it, not an easy and straightforward topic. Thank you.